Hi guys, it's me, Chazzer HD, and welcome to the 50th episode of the podcast, where today me and Nib are going to cover a couple topics on the Russian Grand Prix that happened about a week ago, and a couple other topics in the world of Formula 1, and give a mini, say, preview or look ahead to the Japanese Grand Prix coming up next weekend in 2019 in Formula 1. And of course, I have Nib, as I said, alongside with me today. Nib, how you doing, mate? And uh, yeah, how have you been since the Russian Grand Prix? Yeah, well, I'm doing very well on this fine uh, Friday morning in Australia, um, and I've been doing a lot better since the uh, since the Russian Grand Prix. So everything's been going well, and uh, looking of, looking forward to digging into this podcast. Yep, absolutely. And first, as the title says, we're going to look at how Ferrari lost the Russian Grand Prix. So at the start, of course, Sebastian Vettel took the lead from Charles Leclerc. Now, the plan that Matteo Bonotto came out and said after the race, the plan for Ferrari was simple. Because they were first and third on the grid, what the plan was, was for Sebastian Vettel to pass Lewis Hamilton, which he did, and get the slipstream off Charles Leclerc, and to allow Sebastian to pass Leclerc into turn one and turn two, so Ferrari could have a one and two at the end of the first sector, first lap, no matter how you think about it or say it. That all went to plan. But the plan, from what I have seen, did not include... Sebastian Vettel then speeding off into the distance and pulling a gap to Charles Leclerc. Now, of course, after a few laps, after the start, Sebastian Vettel, not massively, but he did progressively start to pull away from Charles Leclerc. And it was clear that Charles Leclerc was not as quick as Sebastian Vettel in the, uh, the first part of the Grand Prix. Now... I completely understand, you know, what Ferrari were trying to do because at the end of the day, they, in a similar way to Singapore and how they, you know, undercut Vettel past Leclerc, because both drivers are not involved in an individual, you know, driver's championship battle, they've got to try if they can and get a 1-2 finish in the Grand Prix, which I think they were heading for. The problem is... Both drivers are so, at times, equally matched that, you know, the tensions we saw on Team Radio and you know, all that stuff, it can, you know, rise up and actually occur. The thing for, for Ferrari that really was the problem in Russia was Sebastian Vettel's speed that I can guarantee you Ferrari simply didn't account for. They did not account for Sebastian being... I think it was, what, a quarter of a second a lap at times, faster than Charles Leclerc, and he was over and over again setting faster laps than Charles Leclerc nib. As I talked about earlier with the plan, surely Ferrari, again, did not account for Sebastian Vettel pulling away and acting as though he was, you know, the lead driver in terms of the plan instead of Charles Leclerc. Well, I don't think they accounted for that uh, Vettel might not exactly follow the the team orders um, as soon as possible because um, he was ordered, I think, about five times to to do the swap, and then they told Leclerc to do the swap, and the Vettel's like, "Oh no, no, let's not do it," because Vettel knew that in those couple of laps, if he pulled over a second ma margin. Um, after the safety car race I'm talking about, that then Leclerc was not going to be able to catch up to him, and that proved to be true. Um, but there was just it was just so unclear, and once it was clear that Vettel was never going to give the position uh, during the first stint to Leclerc as he was quicker, instead of all the carrying on and hoo-ha that there was on the team radio, which certainly certainly has been overplayed by some people on social on social media, like. Yeah, Leclerc probably could have been a bit calmer, but you know, if if um the driver hadn't in front of you, your teammate hadn't followed instructions when there was pre-arranged team orders, you'd be kind of annoyed as well. Um But then they should have dealt with it, say, okay, we'll swap at the pit stops so that there wasn't a continuation of team team radios. Um 
which just didn't need to happen. And we've seen it in Singapore, Leclerc said that he needed to be calmer. And then it then to see him do it again, people had kind of got jumped on his back. Um so I think it's a bit unfortunate for I should, certainly could have handled it better. Um that's for sure. But yeah, I think that I I do agree with you. I think that Vettel's pace did kind of surprise him because uh Vettel was actually pretty quick at, around Russia. And yeah, as I said, I think that did surprise them. But the real problem for the plan was is that Charles Leclerc was not close enough to Sebastian Vettel, in my opinion, when he was asking to be let through. If Charles Leclerc, during the first stint, I think the first 20 laps is when Ferrari, you know, were out on track on the soft compound tyres for the first stint. If Charles Leclerc had been about a second behind Sebastian for that entire stint of the Grand Prix, then because of the dirty air effect you have in Formula 1 and especially at that track, then Charles Leclerc's complaints would have been absolutely warranted. But because Sebastian was pulling away and Charles was not really that quick in the first stint of the Grand Prix, that's why, personally, I have a problem with Charles Leclerc's team radio messages. Again, if he was about a second behind for the you know first stint, no problem. I can completely understand where he's coming from. And yes, Sebastian Vettel, I guess, did uh, disobey a team order. But even though he did disobey a team order, I don't think the team order at that time that they gave it was correct because Sebastian was clearly faster than Charles Leclerc. And considering the pace of the Grand Prix at the time, I, I really don't think there was a need to swap the drivers round when they were asking Sebastian to do so. And as you say, Nib, Leclerc after Singapore saying, you know, I have to shut up and calm down. And then in Russia, he was even worse when it came to the team radio. So he really does need to because the last thing you need to do is be airing your dirty laundry, as I say, in public. Because... It really did not have to be done between, you know, the team on team radio. But, of course, after the first stint of the Grand Prix, Charles Leclerc pitted before Sebastian Vettel. I think it was three or four laps before Vettel pitted for Leclerc. And it was clear what they were trying to do so that they could carry out the plan that was agreed upon before the Grand Prix. Charles Leclerc undercut past Sebastian Vettel and once Vettel pitted it all worked out absolutely fine but the reason Ferrari lost the race is this picture on screen right now Sebastian Vettel's retirement with an MG UK failure that is the reason he lost the Grand Prix not because he didn't let Charles Leclerc through around lap six or lap seven or because you know, Charles Leclerc was slowing down a bit too much in the first stint um, because he didn't want to damage his tyres in Vettel's uh, dirty air or stuff like that. Because if Sebastian, you know, had continued and had not had that issue, Ferrari would have ended up one and two because this gave Mercedes, as we'll get on to later on, the opportunity to come into the pits and come out ahead and win the Grand Prix. So... I have to say, I think as you said, Nib, kind of, um, that this whole controversy has definitely been blown out of proportion. It's not really this whole old controversy of Leclerc wanting Sebastian to let him through before the pit stops. That's not what cost Ferrari the race. It was this. If, if this didn't happen, I think Ferrari not only get a 1-2, I think it's a comfortable 1-2 finish because how would Lewis Hamilton after coming out from his pit stop, be able to pass any of the Ferrari cars in a straight line. He wouldn't have been able to. So I really don't see how Ferrari would have lost if Sebastian didn't have this issue. And Nib, um, do you agree? Do you think, yeah, Ferrari lost the race based on that? Well, yeah, Ferrari just got extremely, extremely unlucky with the retirement of uh of Sebastian Vettel and where then he he um 
where he retired in that part of the track where there isn't actually an open service road so that the car could be easily wheeled um, off. Obviously, it's not unlucky that, you know, they've had a retirement. That is obviously Ferrari's fault, but, you know, you can't obviously foresee these things. Um, and then it just happened so that Mercedes hadn't pitted yet. They were within the virtual safety car window. And then, yeah, they they inherited the 1-2, which should, which should have been a 1-3 if Ferrari had decided to pit Charles Leclerc um, onto the soft tyre lap earlier than what they did, um, for whatever reason, they hesitated. We called it on stream, and then they ended up behind Bottas. And, yeah, as you said, there was no way a Ferrari was going to get overtaken in that race in the straight line because not even a Mercedes could be overtaken in the straight line in the Grand Prix because the track is that awful um, that you can't stay close enough during the last sector because there's all these slow 90-degree corners where the dirty air of the car in front just makes you so awfully slow. Obviously, and, and as well, it was Mercedes' fastest sector on the track. Um, but still such an awfully designed track as we talked, as I uh, as I like to make a good point of during the race watch-along. Yeah. Um, that, that's for sure. And thank, thank goodness we are not, not going to be racing at that awful, awful track. Um, much longer, that's for sure. So, um, yeah, Ferrari, just that that, um, that unfortunate retirement of Sebastian Vettel did really, really cost them, well, really, what was going to be a 1-2 uh, led home by Charles Leclerc. But you mentioned there, uh, mentioned just a little bit before that, you know, it wasn't necessary for them to swap around. But that, that was the agreement, to swap them around as soon as they possibly could. But then Vettel said on the team radio, um, just after the safety car restart, um, you know, just give me the lead for two more laps so we can pull a gap to the others. But in doing that, he also then pulled that gap to Leclerc, which was at about one and a half seconds. So that's that's when then Leclerc's like, uh, what is going on? You know, like then the team started say Sebastian let him through. Um, that's when all of that started. So. Um, I'm not. I'm not too sure if that was actually communicated to Leclerc that, that Vettel was going to go on for a couple of laps, but who knows? It it, it certainly was very unnecessary um, for it to then continue on. Just say, okay, forget about swapping around now. Just swap around at the pit stops, but it wasn't. And um, I certainly, I certainly think the Ferrari will be wanting to move on from this. Yeah, I think they will as well. But um. Going back to that, you know, Vettel can, saying, you know, let's continue with me in the lead for another couple laps. If the agreement, as I think it was before the race, that, you know, Vettel lets, um, lets Charles Leclerc back through, considering Vettel's speed, would it have been worse to let Leclerc through on track in the first stint, considering Sebastian was faster for you? Um, yeah, prob- probably. I, I think... You know, it, obviously, it's the easiest and um, less t- cost effective, like, sorry, most cost effective way to let them through during the pit stops because then ultimately Vettel has fresher tyres for the last stint of the race um, and would be able to hold off any, any potential threat from Hamilton very, very comfortably. So, yeah, I think, I think it would have been certainly a lot better if um, they had just gone to that plan of undercutting um, Leclerc sorry, undercutting Vettel with Leclerc uh, to swap positions like that. Yeah, because again, um, Vettel, and again, as I said earlier, I don't think Ferrari accounted for that speed and that definitely was not part of the plan. There's no way anyone can tell me that Ferrari, after qualifying and after the weekend, expected Sebastian Vettel to be clearly quicker and have, I think at one point, a five-second lead over Charles Leclerc. No one can say that they thought, you know, that was going to happen after 20 laps or so. But, um, of course, everyone's talking about, you know, the relations between Sebastian Vettel and Charles Leclerc. Are they now, um, in terms of the relationship, is it now broken? Again, as Nib and I've said, I don't think that the relationship is as bad as people think. I think a lot of this is miscommunication and kind of Ferrari getting it slightly wrong on a couple of occasions. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, and I don't really, you know, think that the relations between Charles Leclerc and Sebastian Vettel are going to be massively, 
damaged by this. I think, you know, them crashing, that will definitely hurt their relationship. But I don't think this is really going to be a big, big deal in the next few races or even in 2020, to be honest. Nib, do you think their relations are affected at all? Um, Not really. I think that we've seen earlier on this season that Shell and uh, Sebastian get along very well. And, you know, I don't think that there's any reason for this to have continued. Uh, for that to have changed, honestly, I I think that there is going to be a little little bit more tension there, as you know. I think Vettel Vettel's realised now that he has a real serious challenge, um, for his spot at Ferrari, um, with Charles Leclerc performing so so well, in particularly after the the su the end of the summer break, um, he it feels as if the old Sebastian was sort of back in that race, ignore like saying. Um, as we did mention a little bit during the race watch along, you know, ignoring team orders, um, which he can't, which he was in the right to do, um, as he was was certainly quicker um, in that first stint. But you know, if if Sebastian is to get back to his best, he's going to have to keep showing that showing this and improve his qualifying performance as well. Because you know, even though I've just said that the old Sebastian was back. Old Sebastian Vettel was one of the best qualifiers I think I've seen whilst watching well, whilst watching the sport since well 2008 or so around about there. Along with along with Hamilton, Vettel absolutely was was one of the best qualifiers that I've I've watched. So Vettel really does does need to get his qualifying back in check if it is to actually to start seriously challenging Leclerc. Um, it does seem as if he did have the edge in that race. Well, certainly, well, he certainly did have the edge in that race. And at other races, it seems as if he has had a better race pace than Leclerc. Um, and I think coming up at Suzuka, one of uh, Sebastian Vettel's better tracks, I think we'll really see um, whether or not uh, the old Sebastian is back. Yep, absolutely. Suzuka is definitely a Sebastian Vettel track. Um, but as I'll get on to, probably in a future video coming out later this month, when it comes to Ferrari for 2020 and, you know, contending for the World Championship, unless Leclerc is clearly the number one driver and can force Sebastian into a clear number two position, I don't think Leclerc and Vettel is going to last very long if they are equal in that team, which I'm not sure will be the case, but it'll be very interesting to see how these two get on for the rest of 2019. But of course... With Ferrari's um, cock-up, that allowed Mercedes to come in and go and get the race victory. Now, simply, they won the race because of luck, let's be honest. The reason they won was because, of course, Ferrari pitted earlier. Ferrari were on the soft compound tyre to start with, and Mercedes were starting on the medium compound. So, Mercedes were always going to run longer than Ferrari, and... I have to say, the medium tyres in the Russian Grand Prix did not quite work out as well as Mercedes would have hoped, I think. I think they were hoping that they would have started working properly for them, say, five laps before they did. Five, you know, five laps before Lewis Hamilton started to match Ferrari in terms of speed. So I think the tyres that they started on Mercedes, they didn't really work. But they ended up working in terms of them being able to stay out when the virtual safety car came out. And then, of course, both cars pitted. And then once a Ferrari made a quite a big cock up by not pitting Charles Leclerc as soon as possible when the safety car uh, came out for the second time. Because it's so hard to pass at that track that allowed uh, the Silver Arrows to go on to uh, victory. We do have to say, though... Pace-wise, still wasn't that good for Mercedes. They did not have the pace, I think, to win that Grand Prix. I think they won that Grand Prix, really, again, because of luck. I didn't think it was won because of, you know, they had the speed at the right time or anything like that. Ferrari would have won that race if it wasn't for the reliability issue. So, I think they got lucky, really, in that Grand Prix. But... And, and Chaz, just be just before we move on there, um, you know, yeah, they got lucky, but they were in the right place at the right time to inherit that. So, you know, 
I, I still got to give some amount of credit to Mercedes for still being in that virtual safety car window. Obviously, as soon as the virtual safety car come out, um, it was it was very easy for them to to then get ahead. But you know, Hamilton did a fantastic job to stay as close as he did to Vettel and Leclerc. I thought in the first stint because that after a couple of laps since that first stint, it looked as if um, the Ferraris were going to blow Hamilton away. Quite honestly, in the first stint, but he stayed there, stayed within the virtual safety car window, and. Well, he was there to benefit. And how many times have we seen Mercedes muck up and then Ferrari not be there to benefit from from Mercedes' misfortunes and it was Red Bull. So I think I think uh, you still still gotta give Mercedes some amount of credit. I'll give him a slight amount. Um again I still think it's I still think it is because again they were on the medium, so they were always gonna run until what, lap thirty at least. So I will say though, um, once the the, uh, the medium compound started working for them, they did start to really then come alive compared to Ferrari. But I still, you know, I, I don't think it was as great of a weekend as they really would have thought coming into this race a month ago. But uh, there you go. But uh, now moving on from Russia, we're going to get into a couple pieces of news. Now, first, we have news, very interesting news. That possibly for 2021, we're going to have another new team. Now, you guys may have heard me talk about a team called Pantera F1 Team Asia that's possibly coming into Formula 1 in 2021. They've come out and talked about, um, you know, possibly coming into Formula 1 and what they have. They have a bit of backing, I believe, from SMP Racing. So they have made an entry... With the way they've talked about it, definitely a possibility. Maybe not for 2021, but definitely soon. Now we have another team. The, the name is not confirmed as of yet, but we do know that it's um, the team that is possibly coming to Formula 1, that is a Spanish F1 team, has a connection with Campos Racing. Now the picture on screen of this um, man on the right, he is um, a part of Campos Racing. Now you guys, if you... You know, watch um, GP3 or, you know, F3, F2, GP2 in the past. You'll know the Campos Racing name. Now, Campos is heavily linked to another entry for 2021 or 2022 with this possible Spanish F1 team. I don't know if it's going to be a reincarnation of HRT. I don't quite know yet. Um, but it is, of course, exciting to have another new team possibly applying to be on the grid. They've also come out and talked about how they want to put Pascal Verlein possibly in their car when they once they come into Formula 1. And also, they have said that they expect to hear back from Formula 1 by October the 30th when it comes to whether their proposal to come into the sport for 2021 has been accepted. Now, Formula 1 has come out and said in the last few hours of Thursday, we're currently recording this on Thursday, so that's why I'm saying it, um, they come out and said that they are not currently holding serious discussions of new teams for 2021. So at the moment, I'm not quite sure what is you know quite going on in terms of you know, are there going to be two new teams on the grid? I don't know. I do know that Ross Braun, uh, when he was asked about the Pantera F1 team coming onto the grid, he was saying, you know, wait until 2022 so they can get the regulations and the budget cap and everything like that right for when new teams come into the sport. But definitely uh, very interesting times ahead for sure. And also, before we get on to the next piece of news that I'll allow Nib to talk about, um... I need to talk about and give an update for Juan Manuel Correa, who late on Thursday night, there's been another update as to his condition. He has had surgery, and the surgery, the doctors are considering a success. That's all I know at the moment, because I didn't have that much time to read the statement, but that is, of course, very, very good news. But now let's get on to uh, the McLaren Mercedes news that came out during the Russian Grand Prix weekend. Now, of course... I talked about it plenty uh, during the Russian Grand Prix weekend, and now I'm going to let Nib talk about it. So, Nib, um, what are your thoughts of McLaren and Mercedes 
coming back together for 2021 and beyond? Well, quite simply, they should have never left with Mercedes. Of course, they had a, what was actually a pretty good season in 2014, but then Ron Dennis made the executive decision to leave Mercedes um, power, go back to Honda. You know, the story was written in the stars back of the glory days um, from the from the 80s and 90s to go back to Honda power. Of course, it did not work out. It was an absolute disaster. And by the end of 17, of course, at the time, Zach Brown, and still at this time, of course, Zach Brown decided enough is enough. We need to get out of Honda. We need to go to Renault Power. And even though Renault have actually started to um, produce a good engine, um, certainly as of this season, um, they are no Mercedes-Benz at the end of the day. And, of course, that was an extremely, extremely successful partnership um, from when was it 1995, 1996 to 2014. So McLaren going back to Mercedes for me is only a positive. It's not like Mercedes is ever going to struggle from chronic reliability or a really poor power unit. You know, the, and even if, and who knows if the, if the engine regulations are changed once again, say further down the line, I, I, I could I could only expect Mercedes to be right on top of the re regulations once again if there were to be new regulations. So it's a it's a smart decision in the short term and even in the long term for McLaren. And I really do see this decision as just the start of this this three of Zach Brown, Andre Seidel, and James Key really starting to make executive and really smart decisions about where McLaren are going to go into the future. And, of course, where they want to be, um, say, 2021, 2022, and want to be starting to challenge for podiums and for even race wins again. They've got very good drivers in Lando Norris and Carlos Sainz. And, you know, this time last year, Mc McLaren finished with the second slowest team at the Russian Grand Prix. It, it was looking like an absolute disaster for McLaren. Um but they made some really good appointments as Zach Brown. You, I, th I think you've got to give Zach Brown a lot of credit. Um, you can see in the team that there's a really good atmosphere um, with two drivers who just like to piss fart around. Um, <laughs> let's face it, they're both hilarious. I don't. I think everyone in everyone in the Formula One community enjoys the Lando Norris Carlos Science combination, and um, I can only see I can only see positive things coming for the McLaren F1 team. Um, in the future. Um, so, yeah, it's very exciting news for McLaren. Yeah, no doubt about that. And um, I will say, when it comes to McLaren, I did criticise McLaren a lot during 2018. So I'm still not going to get right behind the McLaren hype train going you know, forward for the future. I will say McLaren are definitely making a lot better decisions in terms of their future at the moment. Um, than they were a couple years ago, where they were basically rushing around, just throwing things together, hoping it would work, and, you know, basically throwing crap at the wall and hoping it would stick. What they're actually doing at the moment is what they um, should have been doing two or three years ago, and is what I was saying McLaren should do, is plan for 2021, 2022, 2023, and that's what they're doing with, you know, Mercedes power coming back, um, also a new wind tunnel. That is great news for McLaren. Again, though, I'm not going to get too overhyped with where McLaren are going, you know, at the moment, because I do want to see whether, you know, they've had a great season in 2019, but I want to see in 2020 whether they can really, you know, take what they've done in 2019 and, you know, step it up a bit. Not that they need to necessarily, but I would still like to see them close the gap to the top teams. Not massively. They don't need to be finishing on the podium at half the races or anything like that. But I would like to see them, you know, continue to close the gap to the top teams in Formula One. But um, let's now go on to the final part of this podcast episode. Now, when it comes to previews for the 2019 Japanese Grand Prix, I will be doing my own on Thursday, next Thursday at 12 p.m. UK time. So don't forget to check that out when it comes out. But uh, now I'll let Nib give his own preview for the Japanese Grand Prix. Nib, 
Um, for all the teams, where do you think the pace will be and who do you think will win the Japanese Grand Prix? Well, certainly over the last couple of weeks, this has become a really um, a really tough race to predict as um, I thought this is a potential race where Ferrari could have done um, race you know, pretty decently well um, even before they had these upgrades which they brought to Singapore. So uh, I honestly think that Ferrari do stand a good chance of winning, but we'll, we'll go through Mercedes first and, and in order in some sort of way. So we'll start off with the reigning world champions, um, Mercedes Benz, and I do think that they will be very strong at this track. They've always been good at, at you know high speed tracks like this. Although we have seen that this year they haven't actually been super super strong in the high speed corners. That is where Ferrari have actually um, benefited in the high speed corners, and that's why I did say um, about a month or so back now that this is actually a race where Ferrari could have a chance. And honestly, Mercedes seem to be switching their attention to 2020 a little bit more, as Toto Wolff has come out and said during the week. Um, and Ferrari have brought some upgrades, continue to bring upgrades, and also I, th I actually think Mercedes are bringing an upgrade um, for the Japanese Grand Prix next week. So, you know, that that will be very interesting to see. But I still I think that Mercedes... Um, at the very least, we'll get a podium with Lewis Hamilton. And if they're not at least getting a podium, then I would be uh, very, very surprised. But of course, it is Mercedes. They could very, very easily get a win. Um, and then I think at the moment, you have to put favourites as to be Ferrari, whether it's Sebastian Vettel, who was extremely good at Suzuka ever since. Uh, I remember he used to actually be quite awful at Suzuka through the S section, through the first section the first, first sector, I should say, he, he never could really get it together. And then he went, spoke to uh, to his good pal, Michael Schumacher, and he said, you just have to create your own line. And then ever since then, uh, he's been an absolute jet at this Grand Prix circuit. So it's going to be a very intriguing battle once again between the two Ferrari drivers, um, certainly in qualifying. And then, of course, during the race, of course, it is, it is relatively hard to overtake at this track. And... I think one one thing that people haven't realized that this has actually become quite a power heavy circuit um ever since these new cars have been introduced because the first sector a lot of it is full throttle which is still quite remarkable and then you look from the hairpin all the um the, from the hairpin up to spoon that's full throttle and then from spoon to the last chicane that's full throttle and that's that's about half the track on full throttle so it is quite a power heavy circuit is is Suzuka and that is why I think that Ferrari um might have the quicker car certainly in qualifying and then I think I think uh, the third fastest team of course will be Red Bull Red Bull Red Bull have seemingly fallen off a little bit in the last couple of weeks not too sure what has happened um Verstappen did look good in Russia but of course had the penalty so hopefully if Red Bull are looking quicker um Next weekend, they can perhaps capitalize on it by not having um, silly grid penalties. And up next, Renault. I think that this is a bit of a going to be a bit of a better track for Renault. Uh, they've they've had a good pace in the last couple of races. They've just had not been able to capitalize. Daniel Ricciardo's rotten luck has returned. Uh, not so much with, rel with reliability, but just getting involved in you know fifty fifty racing incidents. Um, through no fault of his own, and that's certainly something that he wasn't experiencing at the top of the grid, because uh, the madness of the midfield certainly does not ensure um, at the in the top three teams. So, hopefully for Daniel Ricciardo, of course, uh, as I am a Daniel Ricciardo fan at the end of the day, he hopefully he has some better luck. Uh, and then, of course, we've got McLaren. McLaren, uh, how how can you not say that uh that they will be best the rest quite honestly mclaren ever so consistent um ever so good really um now what is it they just clicked over 100 points and i was looking just before when we when i was just talking about the mclaren mercedes deal that um they ended on 63 points at the end of last season and they're already over 100 points um with what five or six races remaining so you can see that how much they have improved this year which is fantastic to 
see. And then we'll move on to uh, we'll go to Alfa Romeo next. I think that that they actually had quite a disappointing um, race in Russia. Giovinazzi got caught up in that lap one incident with Ricardo and Grosjean. And of course, how could we forget Kimi Raikkonen's, uh, well, very bemusing uh, jump start. He, he, I honestly think he jumped the start by about a second and a half. And I'm not poor Kimi. Well, I can't I really can't say poor Kimi, but um, what was going through your head, Kimi? You was, I don't know, was his hand shaking? He'd been drinking beforehand. I don't know what was going on, but uh, <laughs> certainly a, an unfortunate and silly mistake there by the Kimster. Then we'll go on to, to Racing Point. Um, interesting to see how they do at this Grand Prix circuit. I don't know. I thought these upgrades that they brought at Spa, Hockenheim, and then just finished up um, the Singapore Grand Prix were going to be really positive for them, and I thought that they'd be now um, scoring a bit more consistent points. Um, they did score. They did score points at Russia, but I, I think that they had they can still do a little bit better. So who knows? They still might score some points uh, in Suzuka. Then on to Toro Rosso, uh, Danny Kvyat and Pierre Gasly. They didn't have a fantastic weekend. That's for sure at the Russian Grand Prix. And, you know, looking back, they haven't been bringing too many upgrades in the last couple of races. And we talked about this earlier in the season. Um, the two teams had been, who'd fallen down the pecking order were, were really Toro Rosso and Haas. And that's because they don't quite have the money to bring as many upgrades as, say, Renault. Um, well, Mc, I was going to say McLaren, but McLaren have brought many upgrades really since the French Grand Prix, which is absolutely. Um, Madness, even Alfa Romeo um, have been bringing upgrades. So that's why um, Toro Rosso and Haas have really been uh, poor, say, second half of the season, even, even a little bit beforehand. So I think that Toro Rosso probably won't be scoring any points. And, uh, well, the most unpredictable team in the sport, they're absolutely awful for two, three weekends in a row. And then, boom, they can get a fantastic result um, with... Uh, Kevin Magnussen, um, he finished ninth in the Russian Grand Prix, of course. Um, Grosjean involved in another lap one incident and very, uh, very funnily, of course, saying that uh, the drivers need to be more gentleman gentlemanlike on the first lap. Um, does anyone remember 2012 <laughs> uh, where he, where he, well, of course, we all know, uh, we all know what happened at Spa, but I remember that year he, he uh, kill switched weather at Suzuka as well. Uh, just, just a bit funny just for Roman Grosjean um, to be to be speaking about that. And then, of course, Williams. They're not going to be scoring any points. Of course, they might have to. Who knows? Um, there has been this little bit of news of um, Robert Kubica's sponsor, uh, Oilin. Um, question like asking why did they retire the car? Well, I think it's quite obvious why they retired both cars is because, well, um, why they retired Kubica's car after Russell retired is because they didn't actually know what happened to Russell's car for for that sudden um collapse of the front ring fr front wing I should say really. So uh, I'm quite bemused why they were like putting so much pressure on Williams to give them a, an answer publicly as well. Um, it's like you're going to be leaving the team in a matter of races time. So just, just behave, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think it's very hard to, to not put Ferrari as favorites. And then of course, followed by um, Mercedes, but of course it is a track where the, you can struggle on the tires I'm not too sure what the weather's going to be like in Japan. Uh, it could be a, it could be a little bit warm, and if it is a little bit warm, I think it's certainly in the race that will favour Mercedes. But of course, how are you going to get past that Ferrari power unit? Exactly, in a straight line, Ferrari going to be very hard to beat. And I think the race um, result, when it comes to who wins, it really could be decided in qualifying. But as you say, the weather, who knows what that could do? But guys. That is it for episode 50 of the podcast. Thank you guys for coming along and being part of the uh, the podcast and, you know, commenting down below what, um, or commenting down below, sorry, on what we've had to say and, you know, what you think is going to happen at Suzuka and stuff like that. 
Nib, uh, thanks for coming along, mate. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again for Suzuka. Indeed, we will. A much better time for me at uh, ten past four in the afternoon for me. <laughs> um, not not that not that you know, uh, the the ten o'clock start. Uh, my time is is bad or anything, but it's during the day, which is which is uh not usual. So uh, indeed, looking forward to the race. Watch along. Uh, and then hopefully, maybe we might be able to do a live podcast again soon. Uh, there's been <laughs> both Chaz and I have been busy on on the time that we uh, do the live podcast and haven't been able to record it live. So hopefully, uh, we can get back to doing a live podcast because I do really enjoy communicating uh, with you guys. But until then, I hope you all have a have a great week leading up um, to the Japanese Grand Prix. And we'll see you on the race. Watch on. Absolutely. And when it comes to, uh, yeah, again, the um, the podcast, whether it's live or recorded, again, the reason we haven't done a live one in so long is because either I'm busy or Nib is busy when we would normally do a live podcast. The next time we do a podcast episode will be this time in two weeks time, uh, the Saturday in between Suzuka and Mexico. We'll see if we can go live or not. I'm not going to guarantee anything. I'm going to stop guaranteeing that we're going to be live um, until, you know, I absolutely know for sure. But yeah, we'll see if we can go live uh, for the next episode, episode 51, in a couple weeks' time. Just need to make a couple little announcements uh, when it comes to content going forward. Uh, one, you guys may have seen the video. If you haven't seen it yet, it's in the description down below. My driver ratings video for the 2019 Russian Grand Prix. Um, if you did enjoy that series, it is a shame to say that that series, uh, in terms of its own individual video, will no longer be continuing simply because it doesn't get enough views. And I have to make a business decision in terms of what videos are going to do well, what videos you guys actually want to watch. So. In terms of driver ratings in an individual video, that's no longer going to be happening in that series, will now be basically cancelled. But I will say, driver ratings aren't necessarily going to be gone. I might still do them in some, in, uh, sorry, some capacity, but it just won't be in the same capacity as that. But also, just want to let you guys know, what content is coming up between uh, right now and the uh, end of the Japanese Grand Prix weekend? So on Monday, I'll be uploading a video about Nico Hulkenberg, looking at his career and his current situation, and also analysing why, in my opinion, Nico Hulkenberg is one of the most overrated drivers in Formula 1. That'll be coming up on Monday at 12pm UK time. Then on Wednesday at 12pm UK time, I'll be doing a video uh, about Lewis Hamilton versus Michael Schumacher looking at um, can Lewis Hamilton go down as a better driver? Is he better right now? Will he emulate Michael Schumacher in terms of world championships and stuff like that? That video will come out on Wednesday. Then the day after, on Thursday at 12pm UK time, will be a preview for the 2019 Japanese Grand Prix. There's going to be a few different things in that preview because, of course, Suzuka is a special race and there's going to be a few different things to really give you a good preview for the weekend ahead. And then, of course, we'll do a practice to watch along on Friday morning UK time at, I think, 5.30 or 6.30 a.m. UK time. Not quite sure as of yet what the timings are, but I'll be live on Friday morning for practice two, Saturday morning for qualifying, and also shortly after, I'll upload the qualifying review. And then on Sunday, me and Nib will be live um, in the morning on Sunday for the race watch along. So don't forget to subscribe for that content. Bottom right of the screen, you can do it right there. Or go to my homepage and uh, subscribe then. Hit the notifications bell. Also hit the like button for more content like this. And it really does help the channel grow. And also comment down below what you thought of this video and comment down below what you thought of what we had to say on certain topics. And also don't forget to join my Discord server. Link below in the description has about 400-ish people in that server. And that is the best place for notifications for my videos and streams. And so don't forget to join that. And follow me on Twitter at Chaz6110. Like my Facebook page. That's ChazRHDF1 on Facebook. And don't forget to follow my website, chazahd.com, 
for more content like this. But guys, until my next video, the next podcast in a couple weeks time, and until the Japanese Grand Prix weekend also, it has been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye.